Hi, Burton. Oh, hi. Hi, I'm Melanie, producer here. From nice the to hour. meet you. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. I'm very excited that you're on the show today. Well, I don't, I don't believe that for a minute, but it's nice that you're trying to make me feel comfortable. Ah, so what are you going to do? Any plans? You know, I'd rather not do the same old tired thing that everybody else does. It's just so lame to come on and do the same old stuff over and over. Why don't, why don't we try and do something a little more creative, a little more off the cuff, perhaps? Welcome to the program. It is uh, awesome to see you again. I hope you had a great day. I am your boyfriend, George Strombolopoulos. Hey, hey, I am your musical director, Burton Cummings. <laughs> Anyway, today, Prime Minister Stephen Harper said that what he wants to do is to cut... Cut his hair! <laughs> <laughs> what? No. No, 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 no. Prime Minister Harper said that he wants to cut... He wants to cut funding! <laughs> funding for the arts! Yes. Everybody, uh, uh, are, are you going to play that shit the whole show? You know what, George? This isn't working for me. Really? You just don't have what I think it takes. You can call me when you've had a little more experience. By the way, you got far too many letters in your last name. Hell yeah, one of Canada's most prolific musicians is on the program tonight. Uh, you know... As far as music in this country goes, uh, one of the pioneers is easily Burton Cummings, right? Burton's been making records for more than 40 years. The Guess Who? Successful solo artist. Last year, back with his old pen, Randy Bachman. They had a greatest hits tour as well. But now Burton's got a solo record. This is his first record by himself in 19 years. It also might be his most honest record, which means there's a lot to talk about, including them good old hippie days. The booze, the drugs... I think the old piano, which he still has, he still writes the songs on. And Mr. Mojo Rising himself, Jim Morrison, Mr. Burton Cummings, in a minute. But here's his bio. Right, now, as far as rock and roll in Canada goes, Burton Cummings is one of the founding fathers. Uh, you may be familiar with the fact that he was born and raised in Winnipeg, Manitoba, uh, studied piano as a kid, joined his first band when he was 14, but it was four years later, at the tender age of 18, where Burton joined the Guess Who. Now, first as a keyboardist, but then, well, with those pipes, he took over as lead singer, and with Burton on vocals, well, the Guess Who exploded. First up, 1968, and this song. Yeah, These Eyes, a song co-written by Burton and Randy Bachman, went top ten in Canada and the United States. Then in 1970, the Guess Who made Canadian music history with a little song called... American Woman, Mama Let Me Be. Mm -hmm. American Woman. That became the first Canadian song to hit number one on the U.S. charts. And it was the biggest selling single of 1970. Now, the Guess Who have had dozens of hits. But it's like a lot of rock bands, right? Musical differences eventually get in the way. So, after 10 years together, Burton decided to do his own thing. 1976, a man moves to Los Angeles, released his first self-titled solo album. Now, over the next 15 years, Burton released seven solo albums. He hosted the Juno Awards, won a bunch of them. Uh, he's also got his fair share of awards, right? He and the Guess Who have honorary doctorates from the University of Brandon. Burton himself is a member of the Order of Manitoba. He's also in the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame. But when you have a good thing, sometimes you have to go home again. And so the entire Guess Who reunited for a massively successful tour all across this country. Oh, and by the way, in 2006, Randy and Burton did it themselves. They were united to release something called the Bachman Cummings Songbook and then followed that one out with a sold-out tour as well. These days, Burton has a new solo album, his first as a solo artist in a long time. It's called Above the Ground. Everybody say hello to Mr. Burton Cummings. Great to see you, man. How are you? Excellent. Burton, in my hands I hold above the ground, which is your solo record, mm -hmm. which is the first solo record in almost 20 years. Almost, yeah, 18 or 19 years, yeah. Wow. 
Well, it's, this, this took a while. This is 19 songs, so it's actually like two albums. So mm -hmm. you can kind of say it's one every 10 years. Right. It doesn't right. sound as much of a gap, you know. 10 years is a long time. Well, yeah. Not when you're my age, no. <laughs> How did you get to a point where you wanted to put out a solo record now? Uh, Randy Bachman, my dear partner, um, needed an operation on his shoulder from that heavy guitar, being there for 40 years, and uh, he had some invasive, painful surgery, and I knew there would be a window there. There would be an open time where we weren't doing any Bachman coming shows, so I took all my boys from Toronto, the Carpet Frogs, our band that travels with us, and we went down to California and uh, started work on the album, and next thing I knew, it was, uh, it was done. We, we, co we recorded the first 10 or 11 songs really quickly, mm -hmm. And then I wrote some more right on the spot for this, and the next thing I knew there were um, 19 songs. We squeezed everything we could onto one single disc. It's about 75 minutes of music. You used all of it. Yeah. You, did you know that you were going to put out a solo record? Because I wondered if w w when you and Randy are doing the, you know, the Bachman Cummings thing and there was the, you know, the Guess Who reunions and all that, I wondered if, you, if when Randy announced he had to, to told you he had to go have surgery, where you kind of looked around and said, well, what do I do now? I have, a, I have a spot. I, I really had been thinking about doing one for four or five years, because I'm always writing songs, you know. Everybody says, oh, you haven't done anything for so long. I'm always writing and recording. I have a little studio at home, and let's face it, you can do an album on a, on a laptop these yeah. days, so you don't need a, a really huge, elaborate uh, studio. But I thought, you know, this is a good time. It's, it's usually pretty cold in Toronto. I knew the boys would love to come down to California in January, so that was very enticing to them. And once we got going, it was great. It's a very small studio, but he's got all the latest gear. It's Joe Vanelli's studio, who's the older brother of Gino Vanelli. Wow. And he was also an engineer and kind of my co-associate producer. He's also a great keyboard player, so he helped us with some of the arrangements and vocal things. And it just went very smoothly. Who are you the most nervous about playing this record for? Going back to Winnipeg and playing it in front of my old school buddies, oh. probably. Because <laughs> they knew me before all the gold records and stuff. Yeah. Um, but more or less, I say this with all honesty, I'm very happy with the album. I produced this. I pretty well financed it all myself. I got what I wanted, and that was my initial goal. Mm -hmm. And now, if the public likes it, that's a bonus. But I can sleep at night, because this is a record I like. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you, after all this time, I have to be true to myself. Sure. I can't be a hypocrite in my own eyes. What, uh, which eyes? These eyes. That's what I want to hear. <laughs> That's why you have a TV show. That's why you have a television show. The, um, what's, your, what's your relationship like with Winnipeg now? It's good. I have, uh, I have the really big house there. So that's where some of, my, uh, some of my treasures from all over the world are. Don't my tell mother, people that. I'm, they'll rob the joint, man. Oh, oh no. They, they, you never get in with the security <laughs> I got. Uh, my mother's still there, and she'll be uh, 87, wow. I guess, within the next month or so. Thanks again for the piano lessons, Mom, because I wouldn't be sitting here with George had it not been for the piano lessons. You still write songs on that same piano? I still have the same piano that I learned on. That's in my Victoria house, the one I first played a middle C when I was four years old. Yeah. That one's in Victoria. The one that I wrote all the hit records on is in Winnipeg. And then I have a little electric Yamaha in L.A., but that's okay for, for L.A. For L.A., that's right. <laughs> but you still write songs on that uh, piano? I do. I go, it's, it's in the basement of my big house there. It's a 110-year-old it's a Canadian-made Nordheimer upright. I wrote Break It To Them Gently and Stand Tall and I'm Scared, all the solo stuff. And even as far back as Rain Dance with Kurt Winter and even as far back as Sour Sweet and... Uh, just after These Eyes and Laughing, I bought that piano. And I, everything since then, I've pretty well written on that same piano. I will never, ever let that out of my possession, ever. Is, is there a sort of superstition with that piano? No, it's just pure love. <laughs> just, and, and I've had it worked on many, many times by piano, yeah. by piano techs. And I, I got the, the strings hardened, the hammers hardened from middle C down. So it's got that nice rock and roll, fats domino bass sound down here and it. I took the front off so I can see the keys, and it, I hit a big chord, and it just hits me in the face. I just love the sound of it. So I'll, God forbid, if I, uh, if I lost everything tomorrow, you'd see me on the street with that yeah. piano singing <laughs> for my food. I will never, ever let that out of my possession, ever. You know, speaking of food, one of the things about what you do for a living and having the run that you've had is that, I mean, for a lot of parts, you live a normal life, but what you get is you get to be in some really interesting rooms mm. with really interesting people and have neat dinners. Is there somebody in the course of your travels where you kind of looked at them and thought, 
Man, I had a real, I had a real run with that person. Like you, you got, you learned a lot about the business or life from them. Uh, not so much food, but I had an amazing experience in Seattle one night about 1970. We did a show with Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention. And I was such a huge, huge Frank Zappa fan, you know. This was a, a real genius, and I don't use that word very, very freely. And I just, just for a second, I wanted to go to his dressing room and shake his hand and tell him how much all his work had meant to me. Lo and behold, I get to his dressing room, and he's all alone, sitting there. I go in, I introduce myself, hey, I'm in the Guess Who, we, were, we played in front of you tonight, blah, blah, blah. I said, come on in and sit down. Long story short, I spend about 90 minutes with him, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, just nobody else around. He showed me all the scores he had written for the Vienna Philharmonic, and he conducted the London Philharmonic, and... I was praising him about certain instrumental passages on Lumpy Gravy and we're only in it for the money. And the guy did about 95 or 100 albums. He's an absolute musical icon. He was the nicest, most down-to-earth guy, and I got to spend an hour and a half with him. He's gone now. You know, I treasure that memory very much. And another night, I, my very first night ever on California soil, I ended up driving Jim Morrison around in his GTO for about six and a half hours. Come on. And a year and a half later, he was gone. Absolutely. And I, to this day, I kind of think that was the music god saying, this should happen because Burton deserves this. How does, <laughs> how does Jim Morrison get in the car? How do you get in Jim Morrison's car? Uh, it's, it's a long story. I but, need to hear this. Well, okay. I was the first night ever in Los Angeles. I wanted to see the Whiskey A Go Go, yeah. right? And I wanted to see Dino's where they filmed 77 Sunset Strip. You're too young to know that. And I walked miles and miles. I walked about six miles to right down Sunset Boulevard to the Whiskey. Got there about 1 o'clock in the morning. The band, whoever they were, was finished. I stood in there drinking in the vibes. I said to myself, this is where Buffalo Springfield played. This is where the Doors played. This is the Young Bloods and, and, and all these great, amazing acts like the Birds got their start there and all this. So, okay, drank all that in, felt the vibes. I said, okay, now I can go back to the hotel because we were there to, to tape uh, American Bandstand and get a gold record from Dick Clark. I said, now I can go back and go to sleep. I walk outside the whiskey to, to hail a cab to tell him to take me back to my hotel. I jump in the cab. Before I can say anything, the guy says, so, guess you're going to the big party too. So I've been in California now for approximately two and a half hours. I'm no dummy. I said, yeah, I'm going to the party. Let's get going. Next thing I know, I'm winding my way up through the hills past these places that all look like Beverly Hillbillies mansion. We get to the gate and of this place where the big party is. And I say, look, I got to come clean, man. I'm, I'm not supposed to be here, but I'll pay you for your fare. Just please wait here. If I get in, then you can go. If I don't get in, then you got to take me to my hotel. So I, he waits. I pay him off. I ring a bell. Some loon answers the door. Come on in, man. <laughs> All right. So now I've been in, in California in my entire life a total of about two hours and 45 minutes. I'm in some mansion in the hills with, with naked people in the pool and loud music playing and everything. All hell is breaking loose. I find a little piano in the corner of this big living room sit down, start playing a little piano down in the middle register. Some guy sits next to me on the piano stool, starts doodling on the keys up here. I didn't even look up for a while. I'm sitting there playing engrossed in my own little p hands, playing the piano. After about five minutes, I turn, and it's Jim Morrison sitting next to me. And he's, uh, he's having a few cold ones in rapid succession. And he says to me, uh, come with me. I know where the beers are. So, <laughs> I... Uh, I follow the Lizard King to the kitchen, and he opens the fridge, and he hands me a Miller High Life, and we had a beer together, and this was just after the, the famous incident, the infamous incident in Miami, and I asked him, how's that all going? And he said, it'll be all right. It's the, if you know, it's the incident where uh, maybe... Uh, He's said, allegedly. Maybe. Allegedly. But we don't really know. Yeah. So... This goes on for a while, and then he's there with these two girls, and they're hanging all over him, and he's got car keys, and he's had way too much, and, and I'm, you know, this biggest fan in the world. I don't want him driving off a cliff, so I say, hey, look, man, you shouldn't be driving. Give me your keys. I'll drive you wherever you want to go, and uh, when you're done, you know, and you want to get to where you're going, I'll just dump me out, and I'll get back to my hotel. Well, you know, this, I drove him around in his GTO for six hours, and he talked about... Uh, the great Renaissance painters, he talked about existentialism, he talked about the great poets, William Blake and, and Edgar Allan Poe and Rimbaud, and he talked about the universe and infinity and life after death, and uh, it was a brilliant, articulate guy, brilliant in every aspect except self-preservation. Right. Finally, about 6.30 in the morning, he said, okay, we got to get going now. 
They dumped me out, ironically, about five or ten minutes from where I now live in Los Angeles. And uh, a year and a half later, he was gone. And, and I, I got to know Ray Manzarek in subsequent years. And, and Manzarek told me, he says, he says, I don't even think I ever spent six hours straight with Jim. You know, so to me, that was wow. remarkable. That's a, I treasure that, that night forever. That is an incredible story. <laughs> Bernie Cutter's got a new record. It's called Above the Ground. Thanks for coming in, man. A real pleasure.